Welcome back to Coffee and Conversation. And Audi is with us today. I can hear him snoring. He's in the, well, where is he? Right here, right here in the chair behind me. And I can hear him snoring. So it's fortunately, it's not too distracting. But that means he may end up coming out, sneaking in, as he tends to do when he's very nearby. But I'm filming this late in the day, and I think he just got tired of waiting. So, yeah, he is here. So, yesterday, we spoke about Gen Z and the difficulties that these young people are experiencing. And that really seemed to resonate with our viewers. And I thought we would just take a, a more detailed look, take a look at the one major event in their very young lives that I didn't have time to touch on yesterday and see where we can go with this. Because it's pretty obvious to me that I'm not the only one who is interested in trying to find ways to connect with these young people. As I mentioned, they are our grandchildren, either literally or figuratively. These are young people, many of whom are in our lives, more of whom could be. And it would be really nice if we were able to make some positive connections. So we're going to continue with that when we come back. Okay, very quickly, uh, another of my queen scarves. This is one of my Balmoral scarves. I have two categories of queen scarves, the Sandringham scarves and the Balmoral scarves. Balmoral scarves are plaid, obviously. And uh, last week, in fact, I got three more queen scarves. They'll be coming in next week sometime. I kind of had a bad week. I, I did it to myself. I, I got nostalgic for the Queen and decided I really needed to listen to her 21st birthday speech again. Sorry about that. I needed a brief break to blow my nose and wipe my eyes because that speech, boy, does that ever get to me. And I'm starting to think maybe I am just a glutton for punishment, you know, because I know I'm, I'm just going to get all teary-eyed when I, I watch that, but sometimes I just really want to. So, yeah, the Queen's birthday speech, and I needed three new Queen scarves, so I got them. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, my shopping addiction is something I am now going to blame on the late Queen. Oh, life is good. So, off that, back to Gen Z. When we start talking about the generations, and, and I did a whole video about this some weeks ago, and I believe I mentioned it at that time, that the cutoff points for determining which generation is which can be pretty vague, and they can vary from source to source. So roughly, Gen Z is young people born somewhere between maybe 1997 and 2012. I, I'm not sure why they have done that. Now they are looking at generations in terms of 15-year groups, which flies in the face of what we traditionally thought of as a generation in years gone by. We thought of a generation as 20 to 25 years. The amount of time it took one individual from birth to adulthood where they would be able to begin spawning the next generation on their own. At 15 years, this is one of the short generations. Uh, as an example, let me just give you uh, the baby boomers generation, which is usually considered to be 1945 or 46 
right through to the mid 60s, 64 to 66. We are a 20 year generation. The silent generation tends to be a little shorter. They, it's one of the shortest generations. They were the generation that was born in the interwar period and ended at the end of the Second World War. And of course, dates of world events are kind of random. So yeah, sometimes you are going to have a generation and by virtue of the fact that they have been impacted by world altering events, that generation may be shorter, it may be longer. The greatest generation, that's the one that came just before the silent generation, is usually taken to be around 1900, 1901, somewhere in there, right up until uh, as late as 1929, 1930. So it's, it depends on what source you go to for the information. I think it's pretty well determined that the greatest generation is the largest of the generations in the 20th century in terms of the amount of time that generation covers. In terms of numbers, oh, baby boomers, we got it. Because in fact, that's where our name comes from. Uh, people came back from the war and began breeding like bunny rabbits. Suddenly, we had peace and prosperity, relatively speaking. So. People did what people do in times of plenty and produced a boatload of kids. Gen Z, I'm not so sure. See, the problem is that the following generation, which is now being dubbed Generation Alpha, which is, uh, well, at 2013, these children are 10 years old. We don't know anything about them. They don't know anything about them. They are still small children, and they are really not able to display any significant characteristics that might lead us to believe that perhaps they might be just a continuation of Gen Z. We don't know yet. So I have a little trouble with that, but once we've sort of covered the math, we're looking at the young people who were born in the 21st century, roughly speaking. And one of the cataclysmic events that happened in their lifetimes was the lockdown of 2020. Now I know some of you are probably thinking 9-11, they were babies in their cradles. They cannot possibly remember that. Some of them, will be impacted by this, especially if their families were impacted and they grew up with a personal connection to 9-11. But for the most part, this is a generation that cannot remember the event, even if they were born in 1997 at the earliest cusp of anything anyone attributes to this generation. It's not going to be part of their memory, and even if it is, it's not going to be something they could have understood and processed. So, no, that was not the cataclysmic event. It was the pandemic. It was the lockdown of 2020. And the reason I say this is because they were young. They were children in 2020. And some of them were impacted in very serious ways. All of them had a period of time in which they were pulled out of their ordinary social network. The social network all of us had, we went to school, and I know in my generation, you went to school or you were declared truant. In subsequent generations, um, and at this point, we're probably looking at the millennials, it was possible to uh, have remote education, it was probably practical for children in remote areas, not widespread. So this is a generation that was in school and had that socialization group and suddenly had it ripped away from them because of the pandemic. For some kids, 
that period of time was in excess of a year. Uh, for some, it was shorter, but more pivotal. Let me give you an example, because this happened to the son of a friend of mine. Um, my, um, my friend Jackie, her boy was athletically gifted, and he got a scholarship to the Milton Hershey School, which is here in South Central Pennsylvania, on athletics. It's a very good school academically, but it's a boarding school. It's a live-in school. Uh, they stress academics, but they also have a lot of sports opportunities. And college recruiters and professional athletic recruiters from, you know, from the teams, basketball, baseball, whatever, NBA, NFL, whoever they are, I'm not a sports freak. They go to Milton Hershey, too, to recruit. While well, Jackie's son was actively being recruited by three or four colleges when the pandemic hit. Lockdown. And that was it. No more intramural sports. No more games. They were... And they were in lockdown, even though they were in their housing facilities, their dormitories, out of boarding school. A lot of the kids were taken home by their parents on the theory that if they're going to be locked down, they might as well be in their own bedroom. Other children stayed at the school because the parents felt, and this was what Jackie thought when she left her son there, she thought that he would have the best educational opportunities and no one ever believed lockdown would last as long as it did. Well, when the smoke cleared, all of those college scholarships and recruitment packages evaporated, gone. The, the major universities weren't sure of their own status in terms of collegiate uh, sports events. The national uh, teams were not sure about their status in terms of being able to continue to bring professional sports to the public. This was a pretty bad situation for Jackie's son. He went from sitting on top of the world with all of these options to having the rug pulled out from under him. And that is just one example, just an example that, that I happen to witness up close and personal. For others, and in some cases, when children, well, in all cases, children hit certain ages where their socialization becomes unusually important to them. And if a child happened to be in that age group, and it's not the same for everyone, when lockdown hit, if that was their peak socialization learning period, pulled right out from under them, go on home, I'm sorry, no more friends for you. And then they had to, to get into distance education. They were at home, on their computers, learning remotely, being supported by parents who, for the most part, were not qualified educators. And here's, this is just my private little rant. As an educator, I do not understand how the public education system comprised of educators could have said, oh, teach your kid yourself, you'll be fine. Really? Really? I mean, that's like saying that we as educators have no more skills or resources than somebody you just grabbed off the street. It's like, hi there, you need a job, come on in and teach. No, no. And you would think that educators themselves would be the last people in the world to be saying, nah, you, you worry about it, you'll be okay. No, that's not how it works. If you, if you have special needs children, if your children are at an age where, and as I say, this is individual, kids hit this at different points. Not all kids are developing in exactly the same way at the same time. 
if your kids are hitting an age where their intellectual development, their educational, um, their, their ability to, to absorb the education is peaking and you pull them out of the system, you could be retarding their progress for the rest of their lives. Socially, of course, yeah. You're taking kids from their social context, sending them home. Not all these kids even have siblings. For kids who are only children, you know, that's it. It's just no socialization for you. Sorry, go home. We'll see you next year. And that was a major impact on their lives. I'm not even sure they know the impact it had yet, because this is one of those things that, remember, what we are looking at is the very oldest of Gen Z are now 26. So the very oldest of them have fully developed adult brains, okay? The 24-year-olds, not so much, you know, no, their brains are still growing, still developing. So it is very likely that many of these young people still don't understand the impact of lockdown, that they do not have a clear sense of it. It is also very likely that many of them walked away from that experience frightened. Uh, I would have been frightened if somebody had said to me, there's a worldwide pandemic, people are dying, go home, you know. I, I, and mind you, my generation grew up hiding under our desks from the alleged Russian bombs that were going to drop any day now. And I still look at this and say, no, that would have been scarier. We don't know the impact yet. And I have to say, it's not surprising to me when we look at the fact that a lot of of these young people are displaying, well, I'm just going to say psychological eccentricities because I don't want to actually throw it out and say things like, you know, mental illness because I'm not sure that's what's going on. We do know that a lot of these young people are, they are not developing the way we might hope or the way that previous generations developed. And I have to say this with great caution because, like I said, we, we don't know. There, people are, are studying this as we speak, thank goodness, because I'll tell you, when they closed the schools down, my first thought was, oh, there's a dissertation in this somewhere. Because, yeah, it's significant, and we don't know yet. It will probably be 10 to 20 years before there's enough of a body of literature, enough study, to determine if there are connections between things like these children being isolated in the pandemic, you know, three years ago, and, for example, the the number of young people on social media pretending to have Tourette syndrome or, or cancer or dreadful conditions, which frankly is, on the one hand, I want to say it's kind of new, but on the other hand, without having generations with that level of access to social media, who knows? And for all we know, the greatest generation might have been pretending to have Tourette's or cancer if they had social media back in the 1930s. We don't know this. So there, there are so many unique facets to this. And that's what makes me, that's what makes me hesitant to start labeling because we don't know. They could just be acting out. Now, our generation, and by that I mean the boomers, we had a, a lot of Cold War anxiety. And people began to really look at this in the 70s and the 80s. Well, mostly because by then we were the people doing the studies. 
people began to look at this and say, how did this affect our generation? How did those duck and cover drills impact us? Uh, and when you look at it, uh, the science fiction movies of the time, and I do remember this very clearly, the science fiction movies of the time showed hostile aliens invading aliens, monster aliens. Later, as we moved into the 70s and 80s, we had things like Close Encounters and E.T. the Extraterrestrial. It was much more friendly uh, in, in terms of alien life. Star Wars, it was exciting. It wasn't terrifying. And as I say, it's important to remember that was that was boomers out there redefining. We don't know what the pandemic has done to Generation Z. Uh, has it convinced them that they are sick? Are these people who are claiming to have diseases, are they truly deluded? Do they think they are sick? Are they just, you know, pretending to have cancer for clout? And that's usually the way it's described, you know, cancer for clout, that they want followers on the internet so they pretend to be sick. Is that what it is? Or is it something else? Is it that because of what they witnessed in the pandemic, the impact it had on them, is it that they believe they are ill? Maybe some of them do. I'm not sure all of them do, but I'm not willing to just write it off and say, no, no, you know, none of them think they are sick. None of them think they have issues. No, I think maybe some of them do. And is that pandemic related? And, you know, we have to look at this in terms of how did this impact them? Uh, the earliest Gen Z people and the latest of the millennials, were they impacted by 9-11? And it's not just 9-11. Remember, the Brits had their own uh, terrorist attacks in London, in the underground, during that same period. So this sort of cuts right across the board. Um, and if, you know, you want to go into the Middle East, the Israelis have always had it. You know, terrorist attack, oh, must be Tuesday. They are people who have just, they have reared generation after generation with this sort of terrorist threat hanging over them. For us in the U.S., in the U.K., well, see, the U.K. had it with the Irish bombings as well. So who knows? Maybe that is having an impact too. I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows because we're still at the very earliest stages of this. So when I look at it globally and I say Gen Z is hiding out, in social media, they are in their rooms with their phones and their computers and their iPads and whatever, hiding in their, their social media cocoons. Are they really? I mean, are they really hiding or did we yank them out of society back in 2020 without giving them any other viable alternative? Are they doing this because human nature being what it is, we adapt when we took normal socialization from them? Did they just struggle to find replacement socialization? Is this what happened? Did, did a global pandemic do this to them? And if it turns out it did, and like I said, the research isn't in yet, um, if that's what happens, if at the end of the day, we look back on this generation and say, yeah, 2020 had a massive impact on these kids, then we can't look at them and say, 
it's your fault, you're cocooning, which I think is what we tend to do right now. It's like, you're cocooning, you're bad. So in light of that, what I want to say, because we're hitting close to the end of our time frame once again, we need to start doing the outreach. We need to start going out of our way uh, as older people. And that's not just you know, people my age who are like seriously over the hill, but uh, but the, the millennials as well, Gen X, the generations that came before Gen Z, we all need to do some more outreach. And it's going to be a lot easier if we just remind ourselves and make sure that it's in the forefront of our heads that these are young people who underwent a, a pandemic that they couldn't understand, that tore their lives apart. Imagine the high school seniors who were denied their prom, their graduation, these sort of late teen rites of passage that all the rest of us had, that kids look forward to. Imagine, you know, th those people and how this affected them. We need to remember that it is entirely possible that what we are seeing when we watch them cocooning in their little echo chambers. And remember, I got that echo chamber from Sweet History Tea from Lex, so I need to give her credit for that. When we see this, are they maladaptive or are they in fact just super adaptive? When they hit 2020, they found new ways to do things. And yeah, Online groups may not be optimal, but they're certainly better than an entire world's worth of children. And remember, it was the whole world simply crawling home, sitting in their rooms and hiding under their beds, waiting to die from the pandemic. So frankly, I would say that would be the maladaptive behavior. If this is how they are coping, if this was their way of getting past that social isolation, well then, it's going to make it an awful lot easier for us as the previous generations, plural, to go out of our way a little, to reach out, and to help sort of scooch them back into the real world with the rest of us, because it's very clear that 2020 was not their fault. So, like I say, if they found a way to replace their socialization, it would behoove us not to pass judgment on it, but just to look at it for what it is. I applaud them. If this is what's going on, like I say, the research isn't in yet. But if this is what's going on, if these kids found a way to replace the social networks they were denied in 2020 in the pandemic in lockdown, then good for them. Good for them. That shows remarkable resiliency. And if they were resilient enough to find new ways to create social networks for themselves in the face of worldwide pandemic and lockdown, then they're definitely clever enough to respond to some creative, judgment-free outreach from the rest of us. So let's see if we can do that. I, I'm going to throw this out to you. Reach out to a young person. I do this all the time. I love young people. Uh, and we got comments. Uh, in fact, one woman had commented that she walks her dog in a park where young people hang out. And the dog is the icebreaker. People are just perfectly willing to play with her dog. I have some teenagers across the street. I'm going to have to go over and try to spend a little more time with them. Um, my, my big thing is my 
beautiful baristas at Starbucks. They are all very young. They are all very charming. And yeah, I will supplement their reading list and they will keep me abreast of current fashion. So wonderful trade-off. All right. So hopefully we will be able to continue with the discussion. Follow this a little, a little more. And let me know what you think. What do you think we ought to be doing? Because Lord knows we ought to be doing something. After all, we're the grown-ups. It's up to us to reach out to them. They are still young. The oldest of that generation, the oldest, is only 26. So we need to put our hands out to them. All right, we're going to take a look at a slideshow on the way out. Uh, we will be back this evening with just chatting. And let's see, what else? We are setting the clocks back. So if you have not, this is the U.S., by the way. I, I don't think the rest of the world is as foolish as we are about this nonsense. But if you are in the U.S., when you got up this morning, we should we should have been an hour back. Check your clocks, check your phone, make sure you're all synced in. And in the meanwhile, have a terrific day. Mm -hmm.